Okay, so who are you? <laughs> well, my name's Ted Pogorzowski. I'm born in Trenton, New Jersey. And, um, you know, born and raised all around this area. Traveled around the country a little bit, but mainly I've been here for 32 of my four, 34 years that I've been here. Mm. So, uh, yeah, you know, just a normal Jersey guy. What was sort of what was the sort of the initial start for you as an artist that made you feel like you wanted to be an artist? Was it a uh, slow process? Was it did it come early? Did it? Uh... I guess early, more like as it embedded itself, you know, in the life of everything. I I didn't really know there was a separation. I just I was always different, you know, in a way where I had a learning disability, um, and I couldn't thrive that well in school. And I realized a lot of my reasoning for that was my understanding on the world around me. Um, pretty much a lot of people, you know, everybody around me, you know, was, life was moving on. And I just felt like I just kept lagging behind simply because of my learning. I couldn't really read books that well. I couldn't understand a lot of things. And um, it came down to it being where I was more of a visual artist. Everything that I understood, I saw in, you know, storyboards I saw in the pictures and uh, as I started to wonder think about things I would draw them down and then I would look at that drawing and that would sort of make an imprint in my mind and I would learn about the world that way so I just kind of took in everything visually and if I wanted to keep it recorded in my head and map it down I just drew it and that's how I would understand things and a lot of times when I read a book I would just try to draw a scene and I'm really slow at reading a book because it doesn't take that you know fast to draw um, but that was just my way of understanding it. So I think that's how I just sort of tried to survive in this world, is draw um, and uh, use that as a basis for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you become interested in art um, professionally? Um, well, I took a really serious look at it around high school when um, I found comics and storyboarding and sequential art and that was uh, a medium that really spoke to me it was different than painting still life anything as far as art went in the world it just didn't really speak out to me as much as storyboarding and comics did um i never really got attached to any of the superheroes or any of their stories any of the characters sub stories universes none of that you know what fascinated me was the way of telling a story through the visual means through Panel to panel, juxtaposition, and the time pacing spent. The sides of the panel next to whatever panel is next to it, it created this subconscious flow of storytelling that really just came alive. And I felt like you know you could put mini paintings at each panel, and the connection of each mini painting told a story. And uh, so I really clung on to that, and uh, I found myself being interested in the superhero comic book world just because of the sequential storylines. Um, you know, I mean, going to conventions and talking to a lot of artists and stuff, I didn't really like that whole world, as I soon found out. There was a lot of arrogance to it, a lot of competition, and that's not what I was about. I wasn't about working for people and working on other superheroes, doing their stories. I just wanted to tell a story through a means of storyboarding and sequential art. And, uh, that's when I really started to uh, look for penciling positions, inking positions, mainly, you know, on, online, reaching out to some people here, there secretly, because I couldn't mingle in conventions, you know. I, I, uh, I'd Google how to con at a convention, and, you know, they tell you bring your portfolio, speak loud, speak clear, be nice to the editor or writer or artist, whoever you're talking to, and, you know, uh, luck has a, a lot to do with it, and. You know, after going in there and trying to talk to all these guys, I had to realize I'm not much for conversation. I can't talk to people I don't know comfortably about that. And then at the end of the conversation, oh, by the way, hey, do you have a job? You know, so it, that never really worked out at all. Um, but nonetheless, I didn't regret any of the experience. I found out more who I am and more of what I wanted. So I just continued the profession, but in a different route, you know, sort of under the rocks of everything, you know. So I got my first gig doing this four-issue uh, graphic novel called uh, Long Gone. Uh, the writer, Mark Berlini, it was produced, um, published by uh, Marcosia. 
over in the UK. And uh, that was a lot of fun. That was a great experience. I did the penciling and inking on that project. Um, there was the writer, uh, Mark Berlini, myself, the letterer, uh, the anchor, and I'm sorry, the colorist. I was the anchor. Um, the colorist being Aaron Veal, uh, the letter um, was E.T. Dolman, and the editor being uh, Andrew Brinkley. And so it was the five of us. I never met any of these guys. This was all done virtually, just over the internet. So, you know, I did my thing on the regular lead by 17 pieces of paper and um, scanned them in, downsized them over all at Staples and then brought them home on my computer on my little mini scanner and done that and sent them out in forms of email to the writer. He checked it over, did everything. He would send those copies to the anchor that would get done. He would send that to the letterer that got done and then so forth. It just went down the line. That's a good, good couple of years to do. I mean, if I really sat down and nailed it, it would take half the time, but I'm working my day job and I wasn't getting paid for any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. That was just experience. It's on the side, night job, you know, day job being just retail. Uh, what inspires you as an artist? I mean, if, you know, is there something, is it something specific that inspires you or is it like an artist or um, do you work sort of more in your own in your own mind, as it were? Um, I guess just the realities of everything in life. Um, I'd be working at my job, and something comes to me in the blue. And it's hard to say what inspiration, because there's just tons out there. You know, I mean, I'm mainly inspired by the workings of the universe, and, you know, the invisible blah, blah, blah energies out there. Um, because they, they're alive. It was just, just because we can't see them, you know, doesn't mean they don't exist. And uh, I think, you know, as human beings, we're all vessels of certain types of energies. Mm. Whether they're creative, whether they're, you know, there's just thousands of energies out there. You know, we all have a different one that we're tuned to. And just be inspired by the troubles of life. This kind of helps me move on. I noticed that um, you draw on a pretty wide variety of art styles. Um, is this something that came naturally to you, or is this something that you learned? A little bit of both. Um, I really looked towards a lot of Eastern comics, uh, manga, manhwa, um, and I loved a lot of their styles because they really got down the exaggeration, like, the emotion of a scene. Like, you know, one person might see just the face value and it looks like a cartoon. Another person might really see the details and the subtleties of the expressions and the way people talk in a lot of these and um, and the way it looks on paper and just everything about the, the Eastern style of drawing. That really inspires me a lot. Um, but I, as much as I love to do that, I don't, I don't try to mimic that at all. Um, but when you are interested in something and you study it a lot and you're really involved in it, it just starts embedding itself into you. So when you start drawing and you're not thinking of any style, you just want to draw something. In order to draw that, you have to have some kind of motivation or uh, a point where you start, an emotion. And for me, it's emotion. You know, it's what I feel needs to be on a piece of paper. And so that emotion reaches a part of your brain, I guess, that connects to your hand and when you start drawing, the style just appears immediately, like as if it were bedded in you, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's really where the style comes from. It's just the range of emotions. Right. Um, take, for example, the Long Gone comic. Uh, it was post-apocalyptic. And uh, reading the script and getting into it and the character and the world around him and how he had to survive, you know, everything was blown to pieces. And he was in this real rigid state of mind. He lost his family, he lost his world, he has no goals, no future, he doesn't even know why he's alive. He just looks at the world around him and it's gritty, it's depressing, it's very scary, nothing straight. There's no straight lines in any of the comic. It's all just, you know, even even the, uh, the buildings are crooked in a way. And that's the emotion that is displayed through this character, Abe Connolly, and he, um, I guess when you're drawing that, you sort of almost channel in a way that type of emotion. So all of the lines, everything I was doing, all of the substructure, they would come out real rigid and gritty. And that was 
just natural how it flowed like that, you know. So you basic so you take your art style, your or your cue for the art style for a particular picture that you draw, or say in this case a comic from uh, the, sort of the embedded emotion in the uh, the story. Um, be it like a, a written story, like how comics, you know, when you, you write uh, basically a script for the comic and then you sort of re you read that emotion or when you're drawing something, you know, you feel like the, there's a, you know, you feel a particular way about how what's happening in this image and that sort of informs your art style? Yeah, in a way. Um... What really, I guess you can say, happens most of the time in general is that you get the script, you read the scene, you develop sort of a half emotion about it. Mm -hmm. But you just read it, you haven't seen any of it visually. At least that's, you know, what happens in me. So then, there comes the draft. And draft is most important. Just the rough draft. Because that's where you're not working on any kind of structure. Alignment, nothing. Just raw emotion from the script right to the page. And then when you're done with your draft, you pull it back and you look at it. And you look over the script, you look at the draft. And then a new third emotion is born with the combination of the script and the draft. And through that, you pull that emotion out and then you start your final. And that's like the refined product. Mm. Taking a crystal, you know, from the earth and chipping away at the little corners and making it rounded and sculpted. That's what you get. You still get the rawness inside, but you develop a shape out of it. Hmm. Um, when you draw, I might, uh, I'm not sure if I phrased my original question properly. Um, so let me, I'm going to hey. tackle it. <laughs> Don't no, mind I, me too, because I, I swear I have an ADD think about it. <laughs> I'm, just, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just changing tack a little bit here. Uh, so when you draw like a single image, like just a standalone image of something, is that based on, you know, something you're feeling at that particular moment or you know, do you maybe think about something ahead of time before you make the drawing, or do you just absentmindedly start, you know, drawing something? No, most of the time it's not absentminded, actually. I do have sort of a premeditation to it. Mm. A lot of the times it happens when I'm driving, when I'm at work, um, when I'm doing things where I don't have a piece of paper in front of me, but I'm also in a state where I'm just kind of spacing out. That's what they call it. And, uh, it's where you just start seeing something just out of nowhere it just and it doesn't always have to be out of nowhere you could hear a song um, and when you hear that song you think of a scene and if you stay stuck on that scene you just it just keeps moving and developing and then pictures and shapes will appear out of it a character or something and you take those bits and pieces and automatically your brain just locks them down later on you go to your paper and um, your hand just starts to automatically recall those images. And I think that's the basis of where, you know, I would start with a lot of characters. Delving in uh, a little bit into um, yourself as a person, uh, excuse me, sorry if this is maybe a little personal, but has any of some of these emotional traumas that you've, you know, that you've been dealt over the past, you know, five or so years, you know, how has that sort of informed um, your work, if at all? Yeah, no, totally. Um, I think it's there. That's a, it's that's a really good question. I mean, it's, there's a really important role that personal experience like that has on you, um, because. That develops a lot of emotion in the body, obviously. There's a lot of that going on. And uh, when, that hap when that happens, um, that definitely shows through your, your hand and your work. You get a lot more um, broad range of things you can do on paper with more emotions. I mean, you know, it's like a double-edged sword, you know, it's, it's hard to... Uh, do a lot of things in life on certain days when you're too emotional, you know, and you can't control it. But if you take those emotions and you put them on paper at the right time, you can really seriously create some magic. Mm -hmm. Or not, as and in the transform. example 
as in the example where, um, I don't know if you'd mind at all recalling that story where you were offered uh, um, a story to uh, illustrate, but because of sort of the context of the story and how, what you were sort of personally going through at the time, it was just too much and it was kind of made you shut down. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, a lot of those times those emotions do bleed through. Um, I say what happens there is when the people you're working with try to force, not, not necessarily force, but they really want you to work on something and you feel pressured by the art world and by yourself and you, you're like, oh, I got to work on this to overcome this challenge or prove myself. Like, for example, I was working on this scene that was a hospital scene and um, I had previously did a few short stories for this anthology and I did them successfully, no problem. And it was for a horror anthology, and then they wanted me to do this third final story. It was a hospital scene. And I knew right off the bat I didn't want to do it because I had a lot of uh, recent things happen, you know, with uh, some loved ones being in the hospital. And it hit me kind of hard, but I tried going in after it anyway because, you know, the, the words of my friends and people around me that try to support me, they, you know, they try to tell you, like, try to just really focus and try hard and overcome a lot of these odds. Well, I tried. And I did a couple different versions of the uh, hospital scene. I ripped them all up because it got me into a really bad downfall. Um, a lot of these emotions that blipped through under the paper, they just bypassed my hand and they just went straight to my heart. And I couldn't, I, as soon as I ripped up this hospital scene, I contacted my writer and I told her, I was like, look, I can't do this, I'm sorry. I got a lot of trouble in my life. And uh, she, she was completely fine with that. She understood. And as soon as uh, the email was done, I didn't work on any art for like a couple months because it was just, it was too shaky. Um, but that is, you know, an example of how emotion can bounce back. So there is a, a, a thin blurry line to try to control these things inside of you. So you are a very, don't take this the wrong way, you're a very emotional artist. Like you, a lot of what you do as an artist and, you know, the artwork that you produce is, uh, you know, sort of dependent um, on, you know, sort of your, your state of mind in a particular moment. Yeah. Um, but that helps you, and sometimes it's not helpful at all. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, is there something that you do that, um, you know, maybe helps you... Uh, sort of Sort of get back into the game. Try and yeah, exactly. So how do you, mm -hmm. you know, what where do you need to go? Well, what in I order do is to sort of bring yourself back into being able to uh, draw. I try to reconnect with what I'm already familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, if I rip up a project and I don't feel comfortable with it, I try to move immediately. You know, next time I draw to something I'm familiar and good at. Even if I don't need to do it, it's just to get back into the game, get my hand moving again. Um, after the hospital scene, you know, I, uh, I sort of took a sabbatical from drawing, and then when I went back into it, I started off with something that I love to do, which is painting. Um, and it's not even painting a picture of like a scenery or something that's structural. Just throw a bunch of colors that you mix forever in a little palette. and throw them on the, the board and then from there you're looking at it and it just starts coming alive and you just your hand moves and get all these sway movements and it, that's sort of like the positive emotion coming back out and surfacing again mm -hmm. and then from that point in the middle of painting I'll be like oh wait I got this scene for this comic I want to do and then just move the painting aside and then just draw a storyboard real quick you know things I'm used to doing things I you know I want to do you know when I do art doesn't mean I want to do every type of art there's a lot of art I really don't like doing at all, you know. Um, but you do it anyway, or? No. I honestly, with that much emotion on the line, and the time that I have, I just want to spend as much time as I have on this earth doing what I want to do, really. Whether or not it makes it to publication and it makes any money. Um, if I feel comfortable doing something, I'd rather draw the perfect scene in my head with my character than go out and party go out and, you know, just do things 
that like would be social or anything. I, you know, I wouldn't sit on and put a video game. I wouldn't put on movies. I just put on my music and I do my art and I do that all night. Mm-hmm. And um, that's my way of fun. You know, that's my version of feeling alive. Mm. So, what makes you happy? What makes me happy? Or is that too vague? <laughs> it's vague, but whatever. Um, I don't know. Is it... Uh, oh, this guy right here makes me happy. This is not <laughs> Merlin. I guess what makes me happy is knowing that one day my comic that I have inside of me, that I've been working on since I was 15, um, it's called Genoma, and it makes me happy knowing that one day I'm going to complete that. It's going to come alive because Genoma, as I was writing it, I went through life and all these characters I started developing became parts of me and my emotions. I'm a different person each day, so nail it into each different character. And then once I complete like an issue of this comic, which I've done, um, I reread it and I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, you know, it's, this is the essence of life. This is what makes me happy is just forgetting everything else in the outside world, problems, everything, just completely taking a leave from my head at the moment and just being 100% in this story. Like it was the only reality at the moment and seeing this and the characters come alive they sort of create their own personalities. You know, I just sort of created them and gave them a little push and now they just go off and amaze me. And I'm like, you know, wow, you know, you guys are talking to me like it's, you know, you have your own mind and stuff. So there's, there's a lot of mysteries out there with your own mind that in your subconscious, you create things. And then once she comes back to you and starts talking back to you in a way, you start really learning that, you know, there's a lot of invisible, mysterious stuff inside the brain mm. and the soul. Is, um, do you, do you have anything that you, you know, maybe you might want to say to maybe another artist, you know, maybe someone who's kind of starting out, like, uh, you know, kind of just your general sort of outlook on, uh, you know, maybe what the, where they should maybe start pushing themselves. Well, like artistically or, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, the art world, as much as social media and everything out there is trying to push it to expose yourself, expose yourself, get your work out there, move along, make money, become a career. That's not what it is at all. Mm-hmm. That's all external stuff. Art is internal. It's your own personal journey inside of you. So if you're an artist and you're trying to make it into the art world and you don't have any kind of personal journey inside of you, if you don't have an area that you can recluse to, mm. a universe that you can call your own and get wrapped up in, mm. um, then what you're creating are just images that have no meaning. Images mm. you're making for other people. Mm. Stuff they want you to do. Uh, stuff the you know whole outside world is pushing you to do. And that's a different type of artist. It's not saying it's bad, you know. Nothing's really good or bad. It's just, it's what it is. Hmm. You know, it's, if there's an emptiness to something, there's no meaning to it. Hmm. A lot of people will look right through it and just see an image. They just see a style with nothing underneath. Hmm. You know, it has to have meaning. Do you have any sort of final thoughts on uh, where you've come from, where you are, and maybe where you're going? as an artist? Yeah, well I mean this is a big changing point in my life. I'm leaving New Jersey and I'm about to move to Seattle um, where I'm leaving a lot of my friends, mm-hmm. I'm leaving a lot of things behind um, so I'm gonna miss the crap out of this world but at the same time I'm looking forward to going to another world where I'll just be doing my day job but at night I'll have tons of time to myself and I'll be able to really just work on my comic, work on my paintings and my music actually. Uh, I've been creating a lot of music lately uh, I used to play the piano way back in the day, and then played the drums, dropped the piano, and then dropped the drums, and I got back in the piano and started making my own uh, soundtrack to my story, actually, because I want to make a video game one day and a series, like mm. just a complete series, and there's just tons of story in this, and I really feel passionate about it, and so uh, my means is to, uh, you know, move out west, do my day job at night, my art and my music, but I want to use my music to get into the video game industry create music for video games 
start mingling with companies, start meeting people, producers, start just networking through the underground, you know, alleyways of the industry, not the cons and not the external social things. Right. And um, through that, use that as a means to connect to people and one day slip my comic into their, you know, envelope into their, you know, under their doors or something and just be like, oh, by the way, 